Becoming the Boogeyman is, it's a direct sequel to Chasing the Boogeyman, which was set in 1988. Um, Becoming the Boogeyman is present day. And it, essentially what it is, is the Boogeyman is, is in prison. I have built a successful career off the success of Chasing the Boogeyman and the Gwendy books. You know, there's a certain minor element of celebrity there, but Joshua Gallagher, the, the serial killer, has become the real celebrity. To cut to it, bad things immediately start happening that pull me right back into to another story of, of human darkness. Um, the police very quickly become involved. Um, so does the media. And essentially, what we have is is most likely uh, a, a, you know a copycat killer. You know it says right on the jacket copy. And how far would you go, you know, to keep your loved ones? You know, would you let go of the story of a lifetime um, like a big dummy? You know, I follow the story instead of you know turning my back on it and just keeping my family and myself safe. And yeah, that's becoming the boogeyman. And uh, hopefully, it's uh, it's enjoyable. First of all, we talked on my podcast booked back in the day for. I think Wendy's magic feather was the thing that we had the opportunity to talk about. So in the meantime, you had final task come out. You've had both of the boogeyman books come out and like, you've been a busy person, but um, it's nice to just talk again. It's nice to catch up. Yeah, you too. Yeah. Thanks for having me last time. And thanks for having me back. I want to start out by talking about this book, by actually kind of talking about not the story, but the, the kind of format of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and specifically that it's written, it's a fiction story written as true crime. Um, I heard you talking on, I don't remember what podcast, maybe it was This Is Horror, about reading a bunch of true crime and stuff like that. So um, it, what is it about true crime uh, that is this an interesting format to, to read or that's different than like um, maybe your traditional horror story? For me, yeah, um, you know, it, it, it started with the stranger beside me, you know, the Ted Bundy story. And I just remember when I read that, um, it just felt different to me understanding that this happened, that this, that this was not a, a, you know, did not come spring from someone's imagination, but she really did live through this. She really did work with the guy and, 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 you know, develop a friendship and then found out who he was and how intertwined she was in the story that, that kind of put its hooks in me and didn't let go. And I know for a long time, whenever people would ask me, what's, what's the most frightening book you've ever read? Um, I would always say the stranger beside me because it, 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 it's a book that haunted me. Um, just little snippets and, and images and his close calls and getting away and, and what he did that afternoon at the, uh, at the lake where he came back again. And, uh, Oh, there's, there's pieces of firewood that he used, um, in the sorority house at Florida. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and it had pictures and it, you know, it showed the guy and it's like, yeah, this, this guy doesn't look like a monster. He looks like the guy who, you know, was in front of me at, in line at, at 7-Eleven today or, or the guy pumping gas at the next pump over today. And um, yeah, it, it just felt different to me. And, and, and as I read more of them, uh, uh, you know, true crime books, I, I really quickly was able to see which ones were done in a really dignified way. Um, manner in which ones were just probably cash grabs or just done by people who shouldn't have been writing them in the first place. Um, the, the, the ones that really appealed to me were the ones that, that really focused on the survivors and, and the victims. Um, but at the same time, didn't hesitate to look into who, you know, the perpetrator and, and try to at least provide some sense of understanding, even when there really wasn't, you know, something there to find. Um, but yeah, there's always been that attraction and, and the, the photographs were always a big thing for me. I found myself, I hated how they were always in one section or maybe in yeah. two sections. You got to keep flipping <laughs> back and forth because I wanted to see what these people looked like. And, yeah. and, and, and it gave me that you know opportunity because they were there. And, and same thing with some of the crime scenes. It, it wasn't so much, um, you know, I, I, I just like I, I'm not into gory movies. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll watch them, but they're not my favorite. I'm more into atmosphere and characters. So, you know, I was never looking at these crime scene pictures to see blood splatters or anything like that. It was just, again, the impact of the fact that something really happened. And, and I, and I said this, uh, you know, in my last interview there, you know, there, uh, I don't know which true crime book it was, but it was just a photograph of this, of this kind of flattened out grass 
grassy area behind a shed in this suburban neighborhood. And it's where this woman was murdered. And those are the kind of pictures that, that haunted me. So when it came time to do the boogeyman books, and once I decided I wanted photos, those were the kind of pictures I wanted in there. On one hand, they're kind of mundane. And on the other hand, they tell their own story. So, so yeah, that's yeah. where that's where the attraction came from. You know, there was always, I've always said, you know, I, I like doing research and, you know, those stories appeal to me. So this, but at the same time, I think that, I think a really good true crime writer, you know, they, they, what a task they have to, to tell this story and how it affects them and, and, and everyone who survived it. And it, it's just, you know, so this is kind of my cheat. This is my way of doing a true crime book or two without having to uh, really experience that, you know, the, that range of emotions that the, uh, that the, tr the, you know, real life true crime author has to uh, experience. That's um, yeah. I heard you talking about that. Um, and it was one of the things that I, I really enjoyed about your take on it. And I, a couple of years ago was lucky enough to interview Mark Olshaker, who co-authored *Mine Hunter* with John Douglas, oh, yeah. um, and all of those books, and f like a, a, so many things come to mind. Like one of the things they do with their more recent books is every book has the word "killer" in it. So, like at the beginning of it, they're saying this is a bad person, this is a killer. Um, but in interviewing him, he really emphasized how important it was to honor the victims and not to glorify that bad behavior. And so when I heard you basically saying the same thing, I was like, oh man, this is just great because um, there is a tendency sometimes to glorify the bad people or just use um, someone's tragedy for your entertainment or something like that. But um, that was one of the things I was really, I really was impressed by Olshaker because his whole thing was we want to understand why people do these things, but really what we're trying to do is um, show the damage that it did to these people and, and how bad of an act it is not saying like, Oh, look at this crazy person. Isn't that crazy? So, right. yeah, I like that you were aligned with that type of um, kind of mindset. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, I tried to be really honest and, 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 you know, because because those lines, the, those boundaries that you just talked about, you know, in some areas they get kind of blurry, you know, because for, for us who, who make our living writing about the dark side and, you know, we enjoy scary movies and thrillers and crime, you know, books and movies. It's it's there's there's definitely a line there between, you know, finding our, a, a thrill and entertainment value in 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 the fictionalized versions of these things. Um and, you know, stopping and kind of glimpsing yourself in the mirror and going, hey, wait a minute, you know, I, I, you know, you, you never want to feel like you're contributing, like you said, to the popularity of these guys. And, and, and I really try to explore that in Becoming the Boogeyman, where, you know, I put myself through the ringer because, you know, no matter how well intentioned you are, no matter how well of a job you do, uh, as far as uh, focusing on the dignity and, and, uh, of those survivors and, and the ordeal they've had to go through and also the victim. Um, some people from the outside are never going to see it that way. So, you know, I, yeah, I, I put myself uh, through the ringer, like I said, and there's, there's plenty of people, uh, outsiders and becoming the boogeyman who think, you know, uh, Chismar moved into the house that the boogeyman built and, uh, you know, he, he, he's, you know, finding a success through, you know, blood money and things like that, just because I get, no matter what people are going to think that. So I, yeah. I kind of wanted to shine that spotlight and, and really explore it a little deeper. Yeah, that was definitely a theme that I walked away with heavily was kind of that it's and on one one aspect of the book is that it's an analysis of like, how do you make the decision to give attention to this thing? Um, because, uh, you know, it, 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 it could go either way. Do I, if I write about this thing, it could bring it to someone's attention and then inspire them to do bad things. But if I don't write about this thing, what are the outcomes? So how, like, there's like this whole kind of balancing act you have to do to decide, is it the right thing um, to bring attention to this situation? And what are the possible kind of outcomes or consequences right. uh, of that? Like not only just your personal reputation, but like what are the acts going to be of the people that 
now know about it or whatever too. Right. Well, that's it. That's it. I mean, we, we've, you know, there, there's, and, and I try not to weight the book down with, you know, uh, too much, you know, too much, you know, factual drops as far as, you know, what has transpired in real life with this, but, I, but I included some, you know, and th- there is that period where, you know, and it was with Mindhunter and, and, and fr- started there where they really did explore, you know, uh, you know, whether these monsters were made or, or whether they were created by us, you know, or whether they were yeah. just born that way. And, and yeah, there, there's certainly, especially with copycat killers where they, you know, a, a, a huge influence, um, you know, a huge contributing factor is, is the, the popularity thing. You know, these guys yeah. want to be famous like the original, you know, killer. And, um, you know, who does that for them, but the media and the press and, and then, you know, and then it spills over to, that certain segment of the audience who all of a sudden is wearing a t-shirt with Ted Bundy's face on the front or, you know, going to court to, uh, profess their love and, you know, and squeal and like he's a rock star. So, and that's happened, you know, until today, you know, with increasing frequency. So yeah, you know, it's like how responsible are we? And, and no matter how well of a job we do, I mean, it it applies certainly to the true crime writers, you know, some people would say, it, 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 you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at something like I'll be gone in the dark and think there was any sensationalistic aspect that, that, you know, she, uh, was guilty of, um, or her co-writer, right. not at all. I think it was wonderful. Um, and, and really that, that's another one that goes on my, you know, that, that, that book creeped me out, uh, you know, what that, what that killer did, um, you know, sneaking in those houses ahead of time and hiding things and coming back. Just unbelievable. You think, no, someone had to make that up, but, but they didn't. So, yeah. Yeah. But there are certain people who definitely would think all that does is bring attention to the killer. Well, not really, not the way that, you know, she approached it. It brought attention to the, to the people who had survived the attacks and also unfortunately, you know, had not. Yeah. Well, and then that makes me think of, so the first experience I had reading true crime was reading Vincent Bugliosi's Helter Skelter. Yes. And at the end of reading that book, I went from being like, what's going on with this thing to, oh, this guy was just kind of like a really charming chump of a guy like who like got lucky or whatever. Like it took this larger than life personality that I had only heard of through popular media and made me realize, oh, this, this guy sucks. And so- it was effective true crime as in, 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 in as much as it kind of demystified a, a person who should not be glorified. So I think it has in the right hands and under the right kind of, you know, conditions like the ability to take the legend out of the legend, maybe. For some of us. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing is because uh, and with a book like Helter Skelter, um, you know, which I've also, you know, read several times, I, I think about that and I, and I think about, well, guess what? You and I, guys like you and I, we would have looked at him and thought pretty quickly, yeah, this loser. You know, he had no <laughs> chance of, of convincing us to go get him, you know, a pizza from the corner pizza shop, much less doing what these people did in his name. <laughs> but yeah. that's the fascinating and the terrifying thing is that there's there were plenty of people who were not like you and me. And that, that I think at the root of it all, you know, uh, um, a lot of people are asking me now, you know, Rich, you know, well, what, what, what is it then? What, what is it about that fascination with it? And I, and I think for most folks, it, it's a quest for understanding. It's yeah. like, I want to understand how that was possible that Charlie Manson could do that. And I want to understand exactly what made this guy tick, but it's not always there to understand. In, in some cases, I think you kind of can, you kind of can connect the dots. And again, in, in Boogeyman, I tried to do that with, with one of the killers. I, you know, I think the chapter was titled, you know, how monsters are made. So I was kind of, you know, drawing a, a roadmap there for how this particular villain became who he was and how it progressed through time. And initially it was just voyeurism and then it was this. And then, it, you know, it, it eventually progressed to the point where he killed someone and then others. But uh, so, so yeah, I think we can kind of understand this guy, but there's others who you just look at and you think no matter how much you read, no matter how many police reports or psych reports you read and, and, and accounts from people in his life, you just can't figure out what did it. So you, you, then you start thinking, my God, was he born with it? And, you know, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's been my kind of blanket answer to a question that you didn't even ask, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's like, you know, if I do glimpse myself in that mirror and think, well, Rich, why are you so 
interested especially in human monsters because that's what I've always written about you know more than the supernatural and I think that's it it's that just that fascination mixed with repulsion and, and wanting to understand how did that happen yeah you know because I might you know I might get cut off in traffic and think a bad thought and you know, I'm finally old and mature enough not even to like blow my horn and flick the bird. I'm like, yeah, whatever, man. I'm 50 something. I'm just happy to be here. Um, <laughs> but there was a day when, I, yeah, I would flick the bird and, and blow the horn. And then to think, okay, well, what would make someone follow this guy home? Right. Find out where he lives and then come, bo- come back two nights later and, 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 you know, take away his life and things like that. So, yeah, those are the things that I've always been interested in and and i'm still trying to you know still trying to figure out and i think again i'm finally old enough and have a little bit of wisdom to to accept the fact that you know a lot of those answers just aren't available and never will be yeah and i think that's kind of a wisdom that you arrive at after thinking about it enough that sometimes there isn't a good explanation for things and they just happen but that is definitely a question of like the joke in pop culture now is that like every woman is, you know, listening to murder podcasts and watching murder TV shows and stuff like that. So it's like, it's a pop culture phenomenon right now, but I think it's, yeah, it's just like the quest for understanding, I think is like you said, kind of what, 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 but then, you know, um, I think that's why a lot of people read, the horror books they read or the, you know, thriller books they read is like trying to, you know, figure out the topic or something horror specifically, I think. Um, yeah. And you, you know, I think it's, it's that safe thrill, you know, it's like getting on a roller coaster. I hate roller coasters, but I love horror books. Uh, but it's, it's, there's, there's a comparison I think to be made there because you do yeah. get that thrill, but at the same time in the back of your head, no matter how frightened you are, no matter how on the edge of you uh, of your seat you are, except in extremely rare circumstances, you know you're still going to tuck yourself into bed that night and grab the snack you shouldn't and everything's going to be okay. Um, you might have bad nightmares yeah. because of it, bad <laughs> dreams, but, but yeah. That's a great point that I had not thought of that – like it is kind of like being the investigator without putting yourself in that situation. Or like you were saying the emotional damage that has to come with understanding the full picture yeah, um, to write the true crime. Like we're just getting the distillation of what it means or what's important without having to go through the, well, the you struggle. Mentioned Mindhunter. You mentioned mine yeah. hunter. And all I could think is, is when I, when I finished talking about that, you know, that quest for understanding that I have, and that I think is at the root of, for a lot of people, um, I just thought, and then you have people like the guys in Mine Hunter, who, how amazing is that, that they are willing to kind of plumb these depths yeah. of humanity to try to find that understanding, to try to find some level of understanding so that they can, you know, prevent it in the future. And it's just like, wow, you know, um, on one hand, I want to say, how cool is that? And on the other hand, because it is, it's, a, it's just this amazing, you know, concept to me. And then on the other hand, I just think God bless them better them than me because I'd be drinking. Yeah. I'd be like, you know, I'd be divorced. I'd, I'd be a mess. Um, because my brain couldn't handle it. My heart's, you know, the way my heart is, is, you know, ticks and the way my brain works, uh, I would be, I'd be like on serial killer four and I'd be, you know, uh, a shot of whiskey away from being, you know, serial killer number five myself or something. Cause it would just be too much to handle. That's yeah. They're kind of like that. Um, the person who volunteers to go down into Chernobyl to stop the thing, you know, like they know that it's going to change them, but someone's got to do it, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's a good point too, for sure. Um, so uh, you kind of mentioned it, and I, I'll I'll try and sanitize it so as to not spoil anything in the book. But um, there is the so in chasing the boogeyman, it was focused on this one specific serial killer, and becoming another one is looked at. So right. um, and so they kind of serve different purposes. Like the the new one, whose name I have written down. Henry Matheny, right. the new one, Henry Matheny, um, is it gives you the opportunity to look at like um, why 
like the, the why question a little bit more, but mm-hmm. also um, taking the opportunity to, to, to make the point that you made, which is like, they're not all the same. So, um, and, and I guess, where did that come from? Um, where was the inspiration for that specific thing? Was it because you needed to explore that thread or was there some kind of real life person that made you think I can do a character like that? No, one of them, you know, one of the, the things that, and, and I do note it in here, um, I, I can't remember if I use a fictionalized uh, journal or newspaper, but the article itself that I uh, paraphrase is, is, was accurate. And it talked about how many serial killers were operating around Los Angeles, you know, at a certain mm, time yeah. period, I think maybe back in the seventies or eighties. And that, that just kind of opened my eyes that, and cause there was like a couple dozen or something. Right. And, and I understand that the, the, the definition of a serial murderer is some, you know, is vastly different than what, what we think about of like a Hannibal Lecter, you know, a fictionalized character or Ted Bundy who had just, you know, uh, a, a great number of, of victims, you know, you know, you kill three different people, you know, in different settings and technically you're a, you're a serial murderer. Um, but it, it still opened my eyes and it made me think about how that cast of, of bad guys had to be, they, they weren't all, you know, clad in black and uh, wearing baseball caps low over their eyes. And, you know, they weren't the guys that you would, and, and I put that in there, you know, uh, uh, regarding, uh, I don't know if it was Henry or someone else in, in becoming the boogeyman, but I said he wasn't the kind of guy who you would cross the street at night. If you saw him coming, you would just, you'd be, you'd be comfortable walking by him. Um, so they weren't all these, you know, the, these, you know, terrifying, uh, image images that you think of. Um, and I kind of wanted to explore that. I wanted to explore not only more than one in that, in the same proximity, but how different they could be. Um, and, and again, you know, and this ties into chasing the boogeyman where, you know, Carly Albright, who's kind of my sidekick and she's kind of my conscience in these stories as, as well as my wife, especially in the second book. Um, you know, she says, Rich, these killers aren't, you know, you, you want them, you, th- you want them all to be like Hannibal Lecter, you know, you want yeah. them to be exciting and brilliant. And some of them aren't, man. Some of them are just the weird kid who sat in the corner in the classroom and never talked to anybody. Um, yeah. and, and it wasn't just that he was lonely or, or odd. It was that he was messed up, you know, legitimately messed up and, uh, he never got better. So yeah, I, I try to play on that too, where this guy was, was the furthest thing from Hannibal Lecter that you're going to find. Um, but he was just as scary and, and just as dangerous. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and it was, it was because of the format of the book, because I was able to write f- in a clinical way from this, the one psychiatrist, psychiatrist or psychologist, I don't remember which one he was in the book, but, you know, he had done the study on him. So I was able to, you know, really explore this character through his notes, as well as, you know, how I had, uh, you know, crossed paths with him. So, which doesn't yeah. really give anything away. So, yeah, it was interesting. It was, you know, in a way it was a little bit of, you know, the kitchen sink. I, I threw a lot of stuff in there. Um, but uh, that was the first, uh, you know, the first feedback I always need to get was, was it a quick read? Because, you know, I'm not a big stylish, that's an understatement. Um, I'm not a stylish writer. I'm a meat and potatoes. So if, if my story takes a long time to read, um, that's not good. Um, if it's a quick read, then I'm at least halfway there and I'm happy. And because, you know, I think about like a Peter Straub book where you really have to, you know, work to, to get everything that he's intended. And I know me, I, you know, the way my brain works, I'm reading that sucker slow. Um, yeah. but, uh, you know, John Sanford or Stephen King, somebody else, I can fly right through it. So that was important to me because I, I did know that I threw a lot of stuff in there between the, the interludes between chapters and the little interview snippets and articles and, and, uh, that kind of thing. I, I, that was my, uh, my fear. Well, and that's challenging too, because in, in a story like this, I think it kind of demands that there's lots of non-dialogue kind of explanation of what's going on from time to time. And that can really weigh you down. But I think, cause you mentioned the format, it's worth um, noting that in addition to the, the general narrative um, you do have like, basically I, I made a list of different types of things. Like there's newspaper articles, there's online um, like forums, social media, Message stuff, boards, yeah. like, um, social, um, like book reviews and, 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 and stuff. And obviously the photographs. And so 
all of those things, first of all, the narrative part, if you struck out all of that other stuff I just mentioned, I think has its own good pace to it. Um, But like that supplemental information that you um, structured kind of toward the end or beginning of of chapters two really helped the story move along. Um, And it added um, kind of like a, the the cool thing about it is because it's ostensibly written from your perspective, but these other elements are outside elements that either kind of um, correlate what you're saying or, or raise questions or, or fill in the gaps and stuff like that. So um, in pacing, I think the pacing of it was really good, but I think that adding those other outside elements really did first of all, lend to a very true crime book uh, experience, but also just added some extra flavor to it, which was really cool. Like, the stuff that if I was, the way I felt was if I was writing this book, these are the things that I'd be looking at if I was the person in this situation. So it, it really kind of did um, enrich um, the situation. Yeah. I'm glad you thought that. Cause again, I, you know, that was one of my early concerns with like, even when I turned it in with my editor and, and uh, Ed Schlesinger at gallery is, is wonderful. And uh, he, he got right away what I was doing and, and, and made it better. And uh, he really, you know, pushed me to do more of the message boards and the bulletin boards and the Twitter and, you know, all of that. Um, you know, he's like, you, I can tell you're in your fifties, Rich, cause you have a lot of newspaper and telephone stuff. <laughs> and he's like, you know, and I had all along, I had, you know, Twitter and the message boards and all that. Um, but he, 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 through his encouragement, I really increased the presence and I think it worked and, and, and God bless him. He, he was fine with my kind of nostalgic interludes as well as the informational ones where I'm interviewing, you know, a prison guard or the former girlfriend of this killer, that kind of thing. Um, you know, so I was able to kind of carry over some of that nostalgic heart from the first book and then, you know, find a way to tie it into what's happening in the present. Um, but it wasn't, you know, it was never intended just to, hey, you know, a shout out to my old chi- childhood buddies. It, it always <laughs> had a reason, which they would have been fine with. They wouldn't have cared. But it always had a reason to be there, I felt like, uh, whether it was just giving a, a fuller picture of me and, and where I had you know exactly how far down this rabbit hole I'd, I'd thrown myself um or like i said being able to tie in later to things that happened um and even my chisalupa chis whatever the hell um <laughs> yeah you know, you know um that uh you know i toned it down some uh, based on my agent and my editor, but you know, I was able to, to maintain the the idiocy of what it's like when a group of friends who have known each other since they were five get together um, and are trying to shoot off, you know, let off some steam. And uh, I was I was really glad that they let that stay. And it, uh, yeah, it's not every day you get to put your name into something like that. And, and, you know, from the the furthest from the egotistical way that it could be, but it's just like, Oh, you know what? It really fit. And my idiot friends, that's something that would have, you know, that we, that we would do. So, yeah. <laughs> that actually was one of the elements of the book that I really kind of personally appreciated was, so all of this crazy shit is going down and people are dying and, you know, they're, they feel you know, in danger because they're in the middle of the situation. And in that situation, he has among other support people like his, what your, your wife, whatever. Right. I don't know how to say it. Cause it's about you, but it's not, um, wife, um, the, um, uh, Carly Albright character, uh, to support him. He has this kind of annual tradition of doing like the Chizza Palooza right. where a bunch of friends get together and party at his, at his house and that was scheduled for a time during all of this madness. And so during starting at the beginning of the pandemic, me and four other friends that I met first in the third grade started doing this thing where every two weeks we would get on uh, Skype and talk for about two hours just about childhood. Right. And um, we, we wanted to do it for a while just to kind of get things down about like how our life was in case like sometime in the future, the kids wanted to know about us. Like they'd have something to look at. Yes. Um, and it ended up being that, you know, from the summer of 2020, we've never stopped doing that call every two weeks. And now it's just to get together and talk, but having that type of, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the, my favorite things, but you don't think about how you need a support structure and a support support network 
And sometimes when things are so going so crazy, you need to be able to not be serious. So that was a really, I felt like that was a very authentic part of the book when all the friends got together and they were joking and farting and falling in the water yeah. and stuff like that. And fighting. <laughs> yeah. And I tried to make, you know, and, and I tried to, again, I, I love that you use the word authentic because having my wife and Carly and Carly is kind of this, uh, a combination of, of my wife and my, I, I'm the youngest of five kids. I have three older sisters um, and, and several other, you know, strong female presence in my life. So she's kind of a, con- a connection of all these. Um, and having them convince me, no, Rich, you should go ahead and do this. Let your friends come. And Carly's like, I can sneak them in. The press will never see them. <laughs> and, and, and again, that's kind of, uh, I wanted that to be as honest as it could. Cause my impulse would be to turn inward and say, nah, you know, we can't do this. I, I, you know, that's in fact, it's pretty much always me. I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. I'm too busy, you know, because it's really because I just don't want to, you know, leave the house or see people because <laughs> I'm like that. And, and it's usually my wife with the wisdom and the eye roll, you know, that I can't see um, saying, you know, no, Rich, do this because she knows within 15 minutes of everyone being there, I'm going to, you know, look over her like I'm eight going, this is so much fun. I'm glad <laughs> I did it. <laughs> you know, that's probably happened, you know, how many dozens of times in our lifetime. So, uh, again, in the book, I tried to make, you know, without really having to try, it, it was their it was their prodding that made me go through with it. And they were right. You know, it was just what I needed. I just didn't, you know, need to. Well, I don't want to give away what happens in the book. But, yeah, you know, so that was a fun thing to write. And, uh, you know, I toned it down a little bit, but not too much. It was it, it, that's pretty much what happened, what would happen and, and what it has happened over different times. And, and I love your phone call or your, uh, yeah. you know, what did you say? FaceTime or whatever. Cause I used to always tell them this was probably back before social media or maybe it wasn't. And I was just too dense to, to think otherwise. I know it was before like FaceTiming and all that, but I used to always say, you know what, next time everyone's here, we need to like rent a big limo, get a bunch of beer and, and have them just drive us through Edgewood like five times. So we yeah. can just remember all our old stories, drive by our old houses and just have a great night and have somebody else drive us around for four or five hours. Um, you know, and I, and I, even then I remember someone saying, you know, Richard, it would really only take about half an hour to drive through town. And I'm like, yeah, but we're <laughs> going to do it a lot. We're going to do it numerous <laughs> times. So, so that's kind of exactly what you and your friends were doing, um, which is neat. Yeah. It, and, it's funny because nobody has the same memory of things like mm-hmm. this person did this, that person. did. So it's fun to explore like the, the fallibility of our memories and, and yeah, it, yeah, it is a fun thing to do. So I think that you, you would, even if you just did the call, man, I think you yeah. guys would really like love to just kind of explore. Well, even like text that. threads work to some degree. Yeah. I mean, you know, just, just, uh, I mean, I texted a bunch of the guys from the book will be there. I have uh, my first signing is Monday, but then the first big hometown one is, or well, the only hometown one is uh, next Thursday. And we're doing it at this big brewery. And uh, I know a bunch of, of the hometown folks are coming. And um, everyone who I talk about in the book, unfortunately, except Jimmy Cavanaugh, he lives down in the Carolinas and he's been up here some oh, recently, yeah. so I don't think he can make it. But the other, and I texted him last night. I'm like, we need to make sure we get a picture um, you know, Thursday night of all of us together. Cause I want to put it online to show everybody this, th- these are the Hanson road boys that I talk about. And, uh, <laughs> now with your friends, do you ever have that moment where you're like, one of your friends just has completely forgotten something that is so important in, in your memories that you're kind of looking at them? Like, cause I have that scene in chasing the boogeyman with Jimmy where, you know, and we grew up and we were, you know, super tight and we were the ones with the imaginations. I had a great group of friends, but it was Jimmy and I who, who had the, the, the weird brains. It was him and I who, who uh, uh, got into the scary stuff. And, and, you know, I can hear it like it was yesterday. Jim would always, you know, we'd be walking along, you know, talking about something completely, you know, normal. And he would, Jimmy would always say, what if, and then that would start the thread. And nice. uh, so, yeah, he, he, you know, I always considered him a little different in that regard, but uh, at some point he had forgotten something in real life. And I remember looking at him like, are you kidding me? I was like offended. And I had that <laughs> moment in chasing the boogeyman where, and, and the nice thing is, is, you know, we do remember 90% of, you know, the same things, but uh, it, it just struck me that one day that you can't help but being a little disappointed. You're like, son of a gun, man. You're the one guy I thought would remember. 
Yeah, I, I'm probably the guy that forgot yeah. in my in my group. Most do, um, most do. My, my yeah. wife can't remember anything. <laughs> and guys are even worse. So yeah, a lot of them. And and it's interesting because again, in chasing, I have that moment where I kind of like, I'm going to be a writer. You know, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be a writer and I'm going to do this and and I'm going to try to make sense of all this. You know craziness out in the world and, and i'm going to remember and it, and that came from from real life too I, it, how you know i've been i was asked that a lot when i did you know book clubs and podcasts and press for the first book chasing the boogeyman um and i'll never forget i, I had a i was speaking to a woman's club and they were all you know middle-aged to elderly um and so, you know, not the kind of audience you can kind of pull the wool over their eyes. And <laughs> the one lady, she was just so skeptical. She's like, you really had that moment in the snowstorm where you saw your the glow of your house in the distance. And I'm like, I swear to you, I'm like, it happened. I never wrote about it. For me, it was the the deer scene from Stand By Me where I, I, I had always thought about it, but never put it on paper until that book because it wow. felt like the right moment. Um, but it's like, yeah, I, I knew. I had that little like Kevin Arnold voice in my head from the wonder years. That's kind of how I grew up. You know, I, I had my own little inner narration. So when, when somebody said chasing the boogeyman was uh, the wonder years meet songs of the lambs, that, that was a good day. I was like, yeah, because <laughs> with, with not, without intending to, that's that, in my brain, that's what it was. Yeah. So, well, it, I was thinking because of everything we were just talking about that you did kind of do what me and my friends did by, kind of capturing the moment of your childhood and preserving it in a way, even if it's ostensibly fiction, like obviously it's drawn heavily from your experience. Um, and there, I think there's value to that, um, being able to have something to look back on. And I got to imagine that, well, your kids are grown and everything, but like them being able to get a snapshot of, um, what dad's, uh, childhood was like, or the, the memories he, he, preserved and everything has got to be like a really cool thing well, well, um, when when billy uh read chasing the boogeyman I, my oldest son billy he i'll never forget it he kind of came in and he he had this look of awe on his face and no not because of dad's talent but because <laughs> of that first nostalgic section uh, and, and he came in you know after he had read that and uh he's just like my god you and your friends were like a bunch of street urchins you just you know roamed everywhere and i'm like that's what it was like growing up in the 80s and, yeah. you know, the 70s, uh, when I was even younger, I'm like, it, it It really was like some of the TV shows that it's like, there. you know, you went out in the morning, there were no cell phones to say, hey, where are you and connect. So you went up to the doors or you just found them. You know, I'm yeah. like, in our neighborhood, we had a, the secret whistle, which none of us could really do to, you know, let people know we were out and about and, and to find <laughs> each other. There was only one of us who could freaking whistle, but. We went through that phase and then it was the fire hydrant up the street from my house. Just hang there and somebody will find you. And, um, but it was, yeah, it, it, I told him and then we'd come back for lunch and, you know, my parents were fairly strict. You know, my mom was a home homemaker, so she was always there. She would want to know where I was going, who you're going to be with. But as you know, that can change in five minutes. Yeah. You know, well, I'm going with Jimmy, but then Jimmy, you know, forgot he had a doctor's appointment saying next thing I'm no, I'm, I'm with six other kids and I'm, clear on the other side of town, you know, doing something completely different that I told her than I told her I'd be doing. And there's no cell phone to text her or call her and tell her. So you just roll with it and come back for dinner. That's, that's what's important. So, that was the whole, yeah. When I was a kid, the rule was like when mom yelled that it was dinner time, that's when we came home. Like, yeah. and th that was the rule. That was the one rule. So I remember walking into town when I was definitely under 10 years old and like being able to buy cans of spray paint. Oh yeah. Like it was just, there was, yeah, it was a different time, but, um, yeah. and, and, but it really <laughs> opened his eyes to it. And, and again, I love the fact that, like you said, it's like, it's almost like this artifact that's there. They can look at it later. And when I'm not around, um, <clears throat> and their kids are older, um, you know, they can say this, this, this part's real, you know, his friends yeah. really did this. You know, people ask me all the time, did, did your one friend really do what you said he did and chasing the boogeyman and then throw it at his brother and, ch you know, chase him in the street, that, that disgusting moment. And I'm like, yeah, it did happen. And just like <laughs> I write about in the book, I'm like, that is the day he became a legend because none of us had ever seen it. None of us had ever imagined it unless like maybe the monkeys at the zoo who fling poo around, but to <laughs> see two of your best friends, you know, 
slaloming down the street with one of them with a handful of, of you know, excrement is, is not something you, you, even my imagination, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's important to preserve those those times, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Because no, like no one would <laughs> believe them otherwise. You know, you whip them out. You wait till you're 70 to whip that out. And the people aren't going to buy it. Right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, a kind of another thought I had about the book, and there might not be much that you can talk about, is not all the doors are closed at the end of this book, as I guess the way that I'll... I'll put it. Um, and I don't know if you have plans of doing more, but uh, the way that the book ended, it definitely made me want to see more of this world and story. So yeah, that's all in, I'm going to say. In my brain, when I started this book, I mean, in fact, that's one of the things I told Ed, my editor and Kristen, my agent was, and I promise you, this is the last book I'm writing about myself. Um, that I'm putting myself in, I promise, you know, and, but the way that, uh, you know, again, I kind of just, you know, I don't usually plot to intricately, you can tell I'm tired, um, or, uh, you know, outline, I, you know, I'll, I'll outline if the ideas come fast and furious, then I'll outline it. Cause I've learned if I don't do that, I'll forget it, you know? Um, but in this case, you know, the last third was just, I was just kind of like following the story where it was taking me. And it surprised me. Um, but at the same time, and one early reader said, Rich, what I loved about the ending, um, and there's, you know, there, I'm sure there's 10 others waiting in the wings to say, uh, oh, you know, you plotted that cheesy ending all along. But <laughs> what I loved this early reader said was it just felt right. You know, especially those last couple words. It smacked me in the face, but it didn't feel like some huge pre-planned, uh, you know, plot twist to, to, you know, sell a sequel or something. It just felt like how the story should have ended. And that's, yeah. that's how it came about. So yeah, I had no intentions of there being another one. I don't have a contract for another one. Um, but I'm going to write it at some point, no matter what, because there's <laughs> still a story to tell. And I don't, you know, again, I had an interesting question the other day. Someone said, well, are you going to set it right away? Is it going to be like a direct continuation the next week or the next month? Or, you know, have you thought about jumping five years in the future or 10 years? And I'm like, you know what? I have no clue. That's the thing. I, I purposely did leave a couple questions unanswered once I realized where it was going. Right. Um, and, and a couple fairly, you know, important ones, um, or at least interesting ones. I don't know how important they are yet, but they're interesting questions that still, still to be answered. But the way it ends, yeah. To, to me, I, I would be, I would be wrong to not go and 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 see what happens next. And those are the books that I really enjoy working on the most, where it's like I've got to see for myself. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. But I never planned on there being a second book, even. So it's just, again, I'm ho holding on to the stories, to the stories, uh, shirt tails, and kind of just getting pulled wherever it's taken me. But yeah. And you might have that moment of inspiration at one point where you're like, oh, of course this is what would happen. And then that's what kind of gets you moving or whatever. Well, that's what, ha that's the only reason there's a second book is <laughs> I think I might've wrote it in the afterward. I was mowing the lawn and I, I don't know why it, you know, the thoughts were even there because no intentions, I, you know, the book that I was supposed to write, my agent, and I had agreed on what was coming next. I should have been thinking about that, but for some reason I was mowing the lawn and it just, the first chapter of becoming the boogeyman came to me in a flash fully formed and the reveal that happens at the end of the first chapter that connects it directly back to chasing the boogeyman. Yep. That, you know, hit me in the face and I just thought, Ooh, that's really cool. And if I read that, there's no way I'm not tearing through the rest of the book to see what happens. So that's the only reason there was a sequel. And, and, you know, I started working on the sequel and um, based on that first chapter and, and that's kind of, you know, how it got written is just, I was like, okay, I got to know what happens next. So yeah, fortunately, yeah. you know, Simon and Schuster wanted it and they were okay with, you know, cause sequels, I didn't know this, you know, going in, I'm, you know, I'm just the typical, you know, uh, consumer audience. I, I watch everything and read everything. Um, so I didn't give it too much thought, but yeah, sequels are like those tricky beasts where, you know, they, they rarely live up to the critical acclaim of the first book or movie, and the same thing goes with the sales. And I, and I you know, I kind of had my eyes open. Like, oh, yeah, think about it. The sequels are never as good as the originals. And, you know, they're always it's always a marketing challenge and blah, blah, blah. So but I, I just, you know, 
I, I was, I'm grateful to, to them that they allowed me to do it and didn't, you know, force me to do something else first. Well, that kind of naturally leads me to another thing I wanted to acknowledge was that I, I will, uh, I'll, I'll couch this in the idea that there's no one formula for promoting a book and every author does whatever they can that they think is going to get them, um, attention and, and, you know, get their book attention. And I have always found you to be one of the most approachable people, um, as far as just, Hey, let's talk or, or whatever. And so what you did, which was, I thought was great was you have all these signed book plates and postcards and bookmarks and posters. And you said, Hey, and it's like, you were asking for help. It was like, Hey, if anybody wants to get these to their local bookstore, just email me. And, um, hundreds of people I was like yeah well yeah that oh sorry about the thumbs up that's that's a software thing oh that's right that's <laughs> but but that that was one of the things that I thought was great was I wish I I wish I could kind of be an un, unofficial street team for more authors I would absolutely do that but I don't think a lot of people have the idea to just reach out to their audience or their their connections and say who wants to but you did and obviously I did I took one of the packages you could see they only wanted one of the posters, so the That's other one's hanging up. Yeah. <laughs> hanging no, I up tell there. people, I'm like, keep that stuff. If, if they don't, you know, and, and you know what? And the funny thing about that is that some bookstores don't. They don't want it unless it's officially sanctioned through the channels that they're supposed to get it. They don't want it. And that's I've started to include a little slip in there that says it's oh, because because some people have felt bad. They're like, oh, my God, I've let you down. And I'm like, no, you absolutely have not. I'm the one who put you in the tough spot because, you know, they didn't want to take them. But 90 percent of them do. Um People, yeah, yeah, I mean, th that all comes from the social media, which I had to be dragged into kicking and screaming <laughs> because, you know, I, I, I'm just, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm, despite the fact that I am the main character in two of my own books, I'm very much a behind the scenes person. Um, and, and, and that close group of, of childhood friends, you know, that's my inner circle and that's who I trust. And that's who, you know, people always joke. They're like, am I like a new friend of yours? Am I like number 12? And I'm like, no, you're 14. Smart. Ass. <laughs> um, but social media was just such a cool surprise for me. Um, being able to, to get back in touch with people who I knew from the past and played ball with in college and, and grew up with who weren't right on my block. Um, to meeting all these people who had the same interests as me, whether it's movies or books or, you know, um, dogs or, you know, and then, you know, and I've heard the nightmare stories about, oh, I've had to block 50 people in the last month. And I'm thinking, you know, in 10 years, I've probably had to block eight people or something. So I've been very fortunate and, and I've got this great group of people um, who are really supportive. Like you said, I mean, I, some of these folks are like, Rich, thank you so much for letting me take these. And I'm like, stop. I'm like, I'm the one thanking you. And, you know, I should be like getting, uh, I should be like having like sweatshirts or something made up to give to you folks, um, <laughs> which I I'll probably need to do next book because, you know, they've been so helpful, but, um, yeah, it's just crazy. And, and, it, you know, some of, some folks have thought of it, some, it, you know, and then some folks will like, look at the, the expense of it because it's not cheap, you know, by the time you buy an envelope and, and put the postage on it, especially and, and the time. But, you know, I think I come from a different place because, you know, I started cemetery dance 35 years ago when, you know, the first 10 years of my business, that so much time was spent folding flyers and stuffing them in envelopes and, right. and buying mailing lists and, and, and just keeping my fingers crossed that some people would subscribe and, and that kind you know, those kind of things is so much of it was that mundane, repetitive, um, you know, tasking. So when it comes to signing book plates and all that stuff, it's, you know, I just put movies on and I'm happy to do it. And I'm happy that people want them. And, and that whole idea has worked. Um, and, uh, and, you know, amongst the other things that, you know, we try to, I've, I'm fortunate I got a whole warehouse of cool things. So we try to give away things and, you know, make people happy and, and just make it, you know, exciting and, and, and fun. Um, but yeah, I do. I've spent a lot of time promoting it, which is why I, I need to finish the book I'm writing now. And I'm, I, I just need like two weeks of nothing, um, yeah. <laughs> but that's not going to come till November. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. Well, yeah, and and it seems like yeah, your um, your experience getting a public publication off the ground definitely informed 
some of the ways that you approach doing this um, promotion for your book, but I just, I really liked it. And I was like, man, I, I would, I would do this for like all of these people. Yeah. Like if, if they like put that out, I would be the first guy waiting for a package to bring their stuff to the bookstore. So um, that was just a really cool idea. Um, but since uh, to honor our time, there was one other thing I was going to bring up. Oh, yeah. So um, you had mentioned that there's the book that you're working on, which I believe, is it the Memorials book? Yes. yes. Um, which you talked about on This is Horror, and that sounds like a really interesting thing. Um, but also you recently announced um, kind of the re-release or expanded kind of um, Widow's Point with your, with your son. Widow's yeah. Point, did I say that right? Yeah, Widow's Point. It's the okay. complete history or complete story of Widow's Point or something like that. I can't remember what the tentative title is that Simon Schuster is using, but I like it, whatever it is. It sounds cool. And uh, <laughs> hey, I'm so excited to get to work on that. I mean, we're going to probably start, um, you know, around the holidays and, you know, in December, mid-December, something like, something like that. So he's just waiting on me. And uh, yeah. yeah, just to ha- just to have the chance to uh, to go and do this you know, complete full balls to the wall, horror novel and supernatural. And we had so much fun with widow's point, had no idea what to expect because, mm-hmm. you know, we kind of looked at each other and we're like, well, we, we not only did we not reinvent the wheel, but we like purposely threw in every old supernatural chestnut <laughs> we could find and just had, had so much fun with it. And then people were like, this is legit scary. And I like the way you told it and all that. So we're like, we always knew there was more to come. But uh, to have a, a major publisher back us and, and allow us to to do it, I, you know, I'm so I'm just thinking about like what are they going to do for the cover and all these things yeah. that I don't usually think because I'm too busy in the nuts and bolts of the creation part. Um, this time, I think it's because it's with Billy. I'm like, and because it's just, just a, a, an overtly scary book, you know. Um, yeah. yeah, that's our job here is just to you know is to freak people out and. Uh, and cackle when they hopefully email us and say, I had nightmares for a week. <laughs> I've gotten some of those already for becoming the boogeyman. They're like, I've checked my windows every night. Since. Yeah. And somebody else said, I had a nightmare about a guy, you know, eating hair. And I'm like, I learned that lesson from Stephen King. And it's just like, cause whenever I've told him that, you know, thinking I'm going to get some sympathy, like, Oh, I'm sorry, Richie. All I get is like the hands together. Ha 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 ha. You know, I love that. <laughs> I hope you, I hope you have another nightmare tonight. And I'm like, so it's fun <laughs> to be on the other side and be like, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you can't sleep. Yeah. And making people, uh, even more creeped out by mannequins. Um, oh, yeah. than maybe they already were. Yes. Um, but yeah, so widow's point, I have the original novella there and it's jumped up on my, on my list of things I need to read. Um, it's a really quick, because it's, you like, know, that's oh, the thing. Man. It's only 25,000 words. It's a novella. Yeah. Um, and the original short story that, that it, you know, we expanded from was like 12,000 and it was just like, you know, he, he was up at college then and, he, and we both kind of had a phone call one day where we we're both almost at the same time arrived at, you know, Hey, I don't think that story's finished yet. And nice. even with the, <laughs> the novella, we both very quickly, came to that realization, like there is so much more story we could tell about what happens next. Um, so yeah, uh, we, we're really grateful that someone believed in it and is going to let us tell it. That's awesome. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to both um, memorials and to reading this Thank widow's you. point, but then also uh, whatever you guys make out of it when it gets like the bigger release. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, I want to thank you for your time. Um, that was fun. And, that was cool. Uh, yeah. Looking forward to uh, the books that are coming up and um, just wish you all the success in the world with this one so that another one happens and another one and another yeah, one. Yeah. That's what I'm hoping. So. <laughs> I really um, appreciate it. And just let me know and I'll promote it and get it out there. And cool. yeah, that was fun. I, that felt like 15 minutes instead of an hour and enjoy talking to you.